I want to welcome everybody here to uh, another event for SCAD's Guests and Gusto series. My name is Harrison Scott Key. I'm a dean here at SCAD. I'm also a graduate of the writing program. I want to welcome all the students and faculty and everybody else here today. Um, now, I have to say, when I was telling my friends um, that I was, a, I was going to do a conversation with Jerry Saltz today, they reminded me that it was April Fool's Day. They didn't believe me at all that we were going to be having this conversation. Um, but I'm very glad to be here. And I want to introduce Jerry before he speaks. Um, and uh, we'll also be having some questions. And so be thinking of the questions that you want to ask him. And we'll make sure to get to those uh, at some point in our talk today. Jerry Saltz is the senior art critic at New York Magazine and is the winner of the 2018 Pulitzer Prize in Criticism. He has lectured at MoMA, the Guggenheim, the Whitney, and the SCAD Museum of Art, among others, and he is, without a doubt, one of the most influential thinkers and writers working today. When I first met Jerry in person at uh, SCAD Defined Art a few years ago, I believe it was about five years ago, I immediately understood why everybody loved him so much. He's funny, accessible, clever, wise, curious, and most especially, he is kind. I spent two or three hours in his company at lunch and then hearing him speak to a packed house at the SCAD Museum of Art. And the impression that stays with me, even now, five years later, is a feeling of encouragement. He encouraged everybody that he spoke with. He encouraged students, faculty, uh, at lunch at Griffin, he was encouraging the, the, the wait staff. I, I remember that. I remember that about his spirit, and um, I'm so glad that he's here today. They call him an art critic, but whenever I read Jerry, I feel like he's my personal life coach. And this is especially true in his new book, How to Be an Artist, which we have right here. Fantastic book. Everybody needs this book. In it, he offers invaluable insight into what really matters to emerging artists, originality, persistence, a balance between knowledge and intuition, and that most precious of qualities, self-belief. This beautiful book and useful book, I have to add, will help artists of all kinds, painters, photographers, writers, performers, realize their dreams. Now, before I turn it over to Jerry, we do have a, a quick um, poll that we wanna do. Um, and. I want everybody to respond to this poll and later on in the conversation, we'll hear the responses and it will help drive uh, where our conversation goes. So I'm going to show you four different Jerry Saltz quotes. Now, if you've read him, you know that he is highly quotable uh, and I hope he doesn't regret saying any of these things because we have citations for all of them. And so we want to know which of these quotes that you connect with the most. A, we're now living in a kind of Wikipedia art world. B, an artist needs to be able to embed their thought in material. C, this is how the art world eats its young. And D, when art wins, everyone wins. So make your choices. And we'll come back to this in a second. I know which one my favorite is. All right, while everybody's voting, Jerry, um, let's go ahead and um, get going. Uh, students, professors, everybody, please welcome the great Jerry Salt. Jerry, it's all yours. Hey. <laughs> Hello, Savannah. I love you all. I'm really impressed that you're here with me, and I'm really, really, really grateful to be here with you. Um, nobody expected this. Everybody expected this. It was too big to fail. It was too big not to fail. All of that right now, we'll come back to another time. I guess what I'm doing is thinking about you and thinking about what I might have been like as you, my younger self. One thing I want to tell you is you were built to go through these hard times, these dark nights. The angel of death is walking among us. But you were built for this. 
Creativity was there with us in the caves. Creativity is within every single bone in your bodies, my loves. Darwin, it's so sad that he was misinterpreted. Darwin did not say it was their survival of the strongest or even the fittest. What Darwin actually said, and he tried to clarify this for the rest of his life, but it's like a one tweet and everybody kind of goes back to that. What Darwin said was it was survival was dependent on the most able to adapt and to adapt to change. And SCAD and the whole world and everybody on the world now is being asked to do adapt in real time. You have been conscripted into nature's rhythm, whether you like it or not. How we were in the caves is a little bit how you are right now at home in your little weird office at the kitchen table with Nana in the background, maybe making dinner, kids next to you making a mess, people cooking right behind you, somebody making something over there, and who knows how many Zoom meetings going on. This is the way 99.999% of all things were made in the last 50,000 years. We can never forget that once upon a time that long ago and for another 40 or 45,000 years, the studio, the kitchen, the pharmacy, the workshop, the temple, we're all one space. Another thing that's happened to you that you may or may not know is that art loves circumstances like this. It thrives, A, under pressure. And you want pressure? You've got pressure. B, it likes an intimate surrounding. And I don't care how rich or famous you might be right now, there are not big artist studios working with like 30 assistants and staff members. None of that is happening. Everyone is working a little bit the way you are right now in small, intimate surroundings. With more time, more time, because you're in these surroundings all of the time. And finally, and this is something that will never happen to you again, because this is important. Right now you are working outside the harsh light of criticism. You understand what I mean? Nobody's looking at every little thing I write and going, what an idiotic thing, Jerry, or, you know, this is really not gonna work. And all of that is a big fucking mess. Those outside critical voices silenced right now. Viruses come, but viruses also go. Art is long. Art will be here when this is over, whenever whatever this is, and whenever it passes, art will be here. Art will only disappear when all the problems it was invented to address 50,000 years ago or longer, when all those problems have been successfully addressed and it has no more reason to be here. Art is one of the most advanced operating systems our species has ever devised. And it's, it's, it's a way that you can make what you're thinking and seeing. It's a tool for making those things visible to others and not have it just disappear in a second. Somehow it isn't like a song that you sing 
or a little dance that you just, you're sure that uh, equals bird song. Art is an operating system to, as a tool to examine consciousness, the things you think, to depict the things that cannot be photographed, like hell or your inner life, or to draw Nana's face. It's for any purpose you can think of. It's for every purpose you can think of. This operating system is not going away because of a virus. More than that, I want to get a little hippy dippy with you before, you know, uh, Harrison and I really start talking and I can make a bigger fool of myself. I think that art is no more or no less necessary than philosophy, religion, psychology, and many, many other fields. I think that art is not just like a decorative hedge in front of the castle of knowledge. I think art is part of what my wife once called the whole ball of wax. It's no more or less important. I think art is kind of a universal force and this is the hippy dippy part that may be using you and me and anyone that opens themselves to it may be using us to reproduce itself. There's a great quote from Bob Dylan and many artists have talked about this that said, yeah, I don't know where those songs come from. It's like a ghost inhabits me and writes the song. That's what I think whenever I write. I never know where my work comes from. I'm continually amazed, horrified or not. You just have to follow your work. That is your purpose right now. And Harrison and I will get into how you follow that and why and what you can do specifically tailored to now and but to have much more than the next say 30 months of whatever this is from beginning to end but i want you to have 30 years i want you to have more i want you to have a life lived in art this book i wrote how to be an artist and what's so funny about this is I could never imagine writing a book called How to Be a Writer. I mean, I would love to read that book. Like, I have no idea how to be a writer. I'm like a folk critic. I, I, I really don't know. If you want to write How to Be a Critic, I'll read it. But the same way that somebody can write about wine that has never made wine or film that's never made a movie, in that way is what I'm doing to write this book. And this book, by the way, is not about be making you a lot of money. If you can figure out how to make a, a lot of money, write that book too, because I would like to know. Um, this book is, as I said, about trying to help you get through the hard times and the dark nights for, through when demons speak to you and tell you all manner of things, and they never stop, to get you through all of those times and give you this amazing thing that I somehow ended up so lucky to have. And I spend 70% of every bit of my day thinking, God, am I a lucky guy? Because as Harrison and I will talk, I was in the real world, I, I'm no good there. I was a big mess. And so I'm really grateful to be here with you, especially now. I love your school. When I was down there, I was blown away by the camaraderie, the beauty of the students, your work, the way you were together. The environment is off the charts. It's like from another uh, century. And you're all still together. We are all still together, no less than we were just 14 days ago, 21 days, okay? 
my father walked out of Estonia to escape Stalin. They walked to Russia. I mean, they walked to Germany. They got on a boat. They came to America. They didn't speak a word of English. That is hard, okay? They lost their whole family. You wanna know how far back you can trace the Salts lineage? One generation, okay? That's hard. What we're going through is hard. It may not be that hard. And all I really, my whole message to you while Harrison and I are talking is just gonna be, please, you big babies, just work, okay? All right, so yes, I drink double gulps. Uh, I don't drink artisanal cook, uh, coffee, so don't make too much fun of me. Mm. Uh, this is my second of the day. And uh, I'd love to hear your questions. And uh, Harrison, it was amazing to meet you then and the whole staff, and it's really great to be here with you now. Thank you, Jerry. That was great, a great way to start. Um, so you raised a lot of uh, themes that I want to ask you about. But the first thing I want to do, I want to do two things. We, we have a poll answer, so we know which question everybody, which quote everybody wants to hear about. And I'm going to read that one. I think this is probably the most complicated of the, uh, of the quotes as well and something that applies uh, to a lot more than just painting. And it was number B, an artist needs to be able to embed their thought in material. God damn it. Can you talk you know about what? Come here, come here, come here. That was the one quote from my wife, Roberta Smith. God damn you guys, <laughs> who is the art critic for the New York Times. She's in our little office. Meet Roberta Smith. Hey, you Roberta. You, they can't see your face. Hi. What hey. did you mean? Before I answer it, God damn you kids. <laughs> <laughs> Roberta, if you can be in the camera what do you what did you mean and when i use that quote at everybody i did quote her what did you mean sorry by, by an artist has to be able to embed thought in material because it is job number one well let's turn it around when you're looking at art you're reading material you're having an experience of material and all kinds of things are gonna come at you. So I don't know how you individually will embed your thought and material. You have to figure that out. But what, what I guess one way to see it is that you want whatever you're making to have a kind of autonomy where it speaks for itself, where you have a painting has a surface. You know, you can look at how a painting is made from scratch. Every painting you look at, you can see the thinking and the feeling that are behind it. And that's, with great art, I think that's always true. It takes you some, sometimes it's harder to get at. You know, Van Gogh is one kind of a great accessible service, for example. Uh, but there has to be something that magical that happens between the artist and the material that's used so that that same magic can operate between the object and the viewer. Mm -hmm. That's great. See, you. see, you guys are smart. And let me put it in the way a former truck driver would put it. What Roberta is saying is <laughs> let's just say, I shouldn't have said it that way. I sound like Mitch McConnell. Uh, <laughs> what I think Roberta means to what I was trying to say is Let's say you want to make art about the, uh, the diaspora out of uh, Bosnia. And you go to take a canvas and you paint it uh, brown and you bring it to Bosnia and you rub dirt on it and then you bring it to the Red Sea and you bathe it in the Red Sea and then you bring it back to Savannah and you pin it to the wall. And you say, this is about the Bosnian diaspora. My, what Roberta's point is, you may say 
that's what your art is. And there may be a nice little long wall label, but dudes and dudesses, none of that is in the work. None of that is there. It's all outside the work. And all both of us are asking you, it's think of what alchemy is. You're turning your thought, your observations, your feelings, and embedding them in and transforming them into material. It only takes a lifetime. You can do this. <laughs> it, it, art gives up its secrets slowly, but I promise you, if you just get to work, you big babies, you will start to do it in ways that you cannot believe. I, I, you picked the right best quote, there's no question. So that's that's what I want to talk about now, because there's this, you know, in your book, and I think in any creative life, there's this balance between mystery and technique or work, just the, the, the stuff you can see and measure and do, and the stuff, the ghost, the stuff that you can't see or measure. Uh, you, so you did a, an interview in the, the New York Times um, that was published this morning, and there's a quote from it that, that's related to work. You say, there's no wasted time. Nothing will happen if you're not working. Work is absolutely the only thing that will take away the foulness, the curse, and the pain that comes from not working. And once you begin, you will go to a place so strange, so filled with possibility, you've already put aside your fear. Allow yourself to get lost there. Just follow whatever idiot thread you get on. I do. Art tells you something you didn't need to know until you know it. Can you talk that. About, that, about, about the idea of just like, so many people are so frozen, whether it's at the, at the writing desk, whether it's at the canvas, and they, because they don't know what they want to make. And so they're really frozen with how to proceed. Talk, talk about the freedom with just working. Okay. I consider myself something of an authority on not working the same way you all are authorities on not working. <clears throat> this book, they told me to hold the damn thing up. I hate this part. Um, <laughs> this book, which you're supposed to buy for God's sake. I'll hold it up for you while you talk. It, no, don't, don't. I can't bear, please put it down. <laughs> um, I began as you, behold, someone that began like you, but demons spoke to me. And I stopped being an artist. A lot of you think about that all the time. You're afraid, I don't blame you. Doing something with no map, no rules, no charts, no nothing. That's hard, man. That's really hard work. The demons speak to us all. You're not smart enough. You're not a good schmoozer. You have bad ankles. You're not, you're too bald. You're, you have moobs. You don't have enough money. You don't know art history. You don't know how to draw. All of those demons that live in my mouth, you have yours that live in yours. Now listen, I'm 69 years old, okay? And I can tell you this morning, I woke up at about 6.15 thinking, oh my God, I have got to get to work. Otherwise, oh my God, I, I don't know what I'm doing. So the demons aren't going anywhere. After I quit making art, which is one of the most painful several years of, that I ever went through in my life, and I don't wish it on any of them. I became a long distance truck driver for about 10 years. Yes, the only Jewish one, probably. Uh, my CB handle was uh, Shalom Partner. Or, or shal no, the Jewish cowboy. And I would get on and go, Shalom Partner, how's it going? And no one ever talked to me. But I was in agony in those trucks. To make a long story very short, <laughs> at a certain point I said, I'm going to 
I've got to get back in the art world. I can't bear this anymore. Anything would be better than driving this damn truck. Even though other people thought it sounded cool, you might think it sounds cool, and it does, but doing it, not cool. I decided to be an art critic. Now, you have to understand, I have no degrees. I did not go to school. You are about to end up with more degrees than I am. Um, I graduated at the bottom of my high school class. So if you think you're a loser, this is a bigger loser than you, okay? I just want to lead you to the bottom by example, okay? Um, I never did a piece of homework, nothing. And I never wrote a word in my life and I started writing, which brings us back to Harrison's question, which is the only way you can get anything done is not by thinking it through. Thinking is its own beautiful, magical, alchemical process. But thinking and making are two different languages. Mm -hmm. They have almost nothing in common. I never end up making what I'm thinking. Yes, you can choose your material, what size it's gonna be. You might make it out of wood or it might be with the scissors, but you only know what you're going to do by doing it. And I guess I would add another thing about doing it. Other than just doing it, you big babies, because if you don't do it, I'm really not that interested in what you're thinking about doing. I won't do critiques uh, of studios where people say, well, this is what I'm thinking of doing. Well, I don't know uh, what you're thinking and I don't care. I'm, I'm a mean person. I would say, not only do I want you to get to work, the next lesson is finish the damn thing. Mm -hmm. For God's sake, if I, I cannot have you, especially while, while at SCAD or in your apartment right now, in your underpants or whatever, I can't have you trying to begin a, a seven month project of like making sure that every single thing is all tied. To, forget that you will never make it perfect. It cannot be done. Every artist I know uh, talks about as the paintings are loaded on the truck to go to a show or to go to a, a critique, they're running after the painting, God damn it, with a paintbrush, like still making marks on it. When I read my own work, I go, oh my God, I forgot to say the one thing I wanted to say, it will never be perfect. The perfect is the enemy of the good. The perfect is the enemy of art. There's no perfect art, not even Vermeer, not every Vermeer <laughs> is perfect. I can show you a bad Vermeer if we had time. I'm sorry for the long answers, but the long and the short of it is get to work, finish the damn thing, and you have to be willing to become embarrassed. I promise you, you cannot avoid it. I'm embarrassing myself now. I won't be able to listen or watch this later. I mean, look at somebody's laughing at me on the screen. It's, it's unbearable, but it's unbearable to you. I need radical vulnerability from you. And you can do this simply by being willing to be embarrassed. That's how you find things. So I have, I'm sorry, Harrison, I don't mean to talk so long. It's just nice to see another, a guy with a really beautiful haircut on the screen. Beautiful glasses, great haircut, it's nice. <laughs> I love you madly. Um, so I, that's a that's a great point about just doing the work. And there, I think for me as a writer, one of the things that always holds me up when I'm blocked is that I know that whatever I write is going to be really terrible. And it, so just being honest with the fact that whatever you're going to create the first time out is probably going to be pretty bad. And maybe the second and third up to the 20th time out is going to be pretty yeah. bad. 
which raises um, another another question that I want to ask. I'm going to show everybody the book. So one of the things I love about the book is that it's broken down into these lessons or points or tips or bits of wisdom, kind of uh, kind of like um, cones a little bit. And so um, this one, number 22, is about finding your voice. It's find your voice and then exaggerate it. And I know for me as a writer and as a teacher and as somebody who has a lot of friends who are creative and uh, that, that's the biggest challenge is finding your voice. What does that metaphor even mean to find your voice? Because it's so mysterious. There, there are books written about it and people are just, and of course it's a, it's a metaphor from singing or from speaking, finding your voice, but you're using it in terms of visual art and, uh, and you can use it in terms of writing, of course. So my question about that is, you know, how do you, and I think, because because I think it's related to the let um, embed thought in materials. I think those are related points, which is how do you figure out what your thing is? And what does that mean? What is your thing? What is your voice? Is it, is it what you want to say? Is it, I remember when I first started writing and and people would read my work and they'd be like, oh, this is really great and funny, but what are you trying to say? And I'm like, I'm not trying to say anything. And they would just kind of shake their heads and say, well, come back in 10 years when you're ready to ask that question. So what does that mean, finding your voice? That's a really good question, Harrison. Um, let's just say one of the demons that lives in your mouth says, you don't know how to draw. You don't really know how to paint. You don't know your art history. Those that they're all garden variety bullshit, but you hear it all day and all night. What I guess I would like you, in, you then start learning a skill and you wanna learn how to draw. So you start drawing uh, my face or Harrison's face, one of the two bald men you see on screen with glasses. Um, and you learn to draw one of us perfectly. I guess I would say to you, good for you. You're a good little art student. Very, very good. You've picked up a skill. That skill will help you for the rest of your life. However, what I'm interested in is how Megan would draw it, or Joshua would draw it, or Carrie would draw it. How would Harrison draw Jerry? And does Harrison draw Jerry in such a way that every time I see any goddamn crap all the work by Harrison, that I at least know it's his? Mm -hmm. And that's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Let's say, you know that guy, Roy Lichtenstein, the pop artist that painted things out of dots and stuff from comic books? Mm -hmm. Even if you hate him or Andy Warhol, you could turn their work upside down, throw it across a room on a Frisbee, and you would instantaneously be able to recognize who did it. That is style, but it's also mm -hmm. an aspect of your own voice. And oftentimes what Harrison is leading to is that voice will say shameful things about you. Your inner life is not completely politically correct, for example. All of your thoughts are not good little humanists. The skill you have is not supposed to be just perfect. And by the way, what is perfect? What's a perfect pot? I don't know. Is it Mozart perfect? If Mozart is perfect, then why did Beethoven have to exist? But if Beethoven is, is perfect, why did Wagner come along and say out loud, nobody's going to get in front of me? And then why would Louis Armstrong, who knew all that stuff inside out, go, I have my own voice to say it? You're all Louis Armstrong. You're all Mozarts. And as Harrison points out, nobody asks, what does Louis Armstrong mean? When, if you ask me what my work means, I would just scratch my head and say, you know that song by ABBA, Dancing Queen? Nobody asks what that means when I'm dancing around naked alone in my apartment. Nobody asks you, God willing. Um, 
Forget about what it means. What we're talking about is not what you make. It's how you make it. That mm. is all I'm looking at. You can tell me it's about scrambled eggs and I might think it's about a, a wheat field. That part, I don't care about. Do you feel like, so, you know, for, for somebody's work to strike a chord with, you know, there are a number of people, I think in the book you say that you have to, you have to know 12 people. I think that's, that's the number you put it at. And, you, you know, you talk about yeah. a couple of critics, a few gallerists, a few collectors, five or six, and that, that's all it really takes to sort of have a career. It's right. connecting with 12 people. So do you feel like those 12 or that, you know, two dozen or those 10, whatever, have, they have to find something common in your work? You know, I, I found, I mean, no. some people just get that you don't think so. No, I would tell everybody listening to this, consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Emerson said that. Don't be consistent. You can start the morning uh, doing a sewing project. Then you might go to dancing. Then you might use your iPhone for a camera. Then I don't know what you're going to do and post it on Instagram. I guess what I was saying about that career thing is this, and I really want you kids to hear this now. How big does your audience have to be? Does it have to be like Jeff Koons, huge? Does it have to be a billion people? Well, that's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you want, good luck. But here's what you really need. I want you to think about this. To have a career, this is all you need. You don't have to worry about convincing uh, 20,000 people of your work. Here's all you have to do you need to convince one goddamn art dealer who's as big a loser as you, as far as I'm concerned, or me, that really sees something in your work. A person willing to go through the good times and the bad times, who will pay you if you ever, God willing, ever sell anything. Somebody willing to tell you the truth to not sugarcoat it, to never be mean to you, to always be there for you. Somebody you feel as a comrade in arms, an art dealer. You need one dealer. Mm -hmm. How many collectors do you think you need, kids? I want you all to pause and answer the number out loud or to me or whatever, I can't hear you. I would say, to get through first five or 10 years of your career, if you had just five collectors that bought your work from time to time, and each one of them would tell their richer friends than you about your bad art that shows with this loser art dealer like me or you, five collectors would get you through just enough to earn enough money to not have to be working all the, all the, all the time. How many critics? Eh, be nice to have two in your generation. And let's throw in a curator, like those people that wear nice black glasses and they wear black suits and they have big ideas and they want to ship you to Venice or some crap like that, whatever. I'm all for any of it. Right now, I've showed you that you really only need to convince a handful of people with your bad art. And surely you can do that. I did it. And if I can do it and end up willing, winning a Pulitzer Prize while sitting at this dumb desk, I got an email that said, Pulitzer. No idea. My wife and I were working just like she's over there now. Just like all we do, we have no life. This is all we do. We work like you eventually, but artists, never mind. And I found out, that's how I found out I got a Pulitzer in live time. And you know what it was like? It felt real good. It felt really good to have danced in public naked because that's what you're all doing. You are all such messed up people, artists, 
that most people are at home right now kissing their mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, husbands, wives, dogs, and cats. But you are, and they're getting their love at home in private. Artists, for some reason, need to dance naked in public and have other people mirror or react to or reflect or be aware of what you do. Some artists are okay if they make a meal and only they eat it. No one ever eats it in the whole world but them. That's fine with me. But I'd say most of you are about as messed up as I am where you wouldn't mind feeding some other people even if they hate your food. Um, find your own voice. Tell your own story, as Louise Bourgeois said, and you will be interesting. Doesn't mean everybody's going to love you, but it will be that extra element that Roberta talked about at the beginning of this lecture, that weird thing that you are embedding inside of the material of your work will telegraph little mystical signals that come out and other people will go, well, that weird pot seems interesting. So I'm going to um, I'm going to ask a few questions from our students and others who are watching. I'm going to read here. Alexander Hawkins uh, says, we're truly living in one of the strangest timelines. Art fairs, galleries, museums are being forced to truly try the online format. Do you think this will stick? What do you think will make it work? Uh, Alexander, great question, really. I don't want to get too apocalyptic here. I am, that art world that we used to know, the one that was big, mega, busy, hyperactive, hyper-professional, hyper, hyper moneyed, even though you have to understand we were obsessed with the 1% of 1% of 1% of artists who made money, about, you know, say 50, mostly white male artists, while the 99.999% of all the artists on the planet, they're not making money, but we became obsessed with the 1%, the 0.1%. That art world of art fairs, nonstop biennials, obscene amounts of money, uh, dick waving contests by uh, men at auction who only get the kicks from buying in public, that is beginning to die. As we sit alone, as the angel of death walks among us, a lot of that will not emerge on the other side. The chef, David Chang, estimated that 90% of all restaurants will not open on the other side of this. Mm. It's possible he's right. I'm not a pessimist. I love art galleries. I truly do. That's where, I, that's where the art comes from, for me. It's like a bank robber needs banks. I need art galleries. And they're free. Um, I think most galleries aren't gonna open. A lot of museums are in trouble. We're all finding out that this can be done on a much, much smaller footprint, Alexander. But I must add an important caveat. After the 1918 influenza killed, I cannot remember how many people it is, 50 million people. It faded into history. No one talked about it. It was not written about much except as this thing that happened and the roaring 20s started after 9-11. After the financial collapse of 2008, everybody said everything would be different. But the, the truth about human nature is Sometimes when these things happen, and this is one of those things, we only become more of what we already were. So none of us can predict what will come of this, but I wanna say this to anybody listening. The stuff that you find inside of yourself now will go forward with you for the, every day of your life. 
and that you're lucky and it's going to give you a lot of strength alexander in all of you all of you if you get to work bang i'm going to hit you bang very bad if you don't thanks for that question you want to go back and look okay, at what so one of your um number 42 of your in your book the um, what do you call these? Are these are these uh, cones? Or are they tips? Or are they just ideas? What do you call them? I, I like all those words: cones, ideas, prompts, nodules. Uh -huh. They form constellations. I don't know what they are. I don't know what's in the book until somebody tells me. It's strange. They're like little essays, little micro essays. Well, this so long. it's not that long. You could read a damn page. Even I can read that. I read it uh, in in two days while homeschooling my children. Uh, totally, it's a it's a book that you'll come back to a lot. Yeah, um, and it's a book that's a that's a quick read too. Number forty two, you say, "Be a vampire, form a coven." Now, yeah. it's about clicks, about the need for a click for your crew, but everybody's isolated. So, how do we do that? How do we find our click or our crew while we're all uh, in social isolation right now. I'm really, really glad you remembered to bring that up, Harrison, because I, I thought about it before. I've always said to artists that you should stay up, if you can, stay up late every single night with others of your own kind. That means even if you're in a relationship, make sure the relationship can take it, but do that. Artists, you need each other. You're developing new languages that I don't know, and I may never speak, but that's what you're doing together. You're touching your little antenna together all the time in this group mind, tribal-like uh, way. And it's important for artists always to be together and to stick together, no matter what. The weakest person in your little vampire coven you better protect them the most because somebody in that coven thinks you're the weak one or that I'm the, and then I think it's her and she thinks it's him and he thinks it's me too. So you have to stick together, A. But now what do you do if you can't see each other physically? Nobody can, not really. Many of you have dispersed rightfully back to different cities and countries. I beg you, Viruses come, but viruses go. Schools will go on. Some will close. Some will close. But you must stay in contact with each other. You are important to each other. You are more important to each other than all the news going on outside. Listening to uh, geezer art critics. I, and I love myself. I love what I'm trying to tell you. But no matter the value of whatever I say, can't begin to light a candle to the weird stuff you're telling each other. That that's when artists always teach each other. When the teachers go home, as as useful and important as teachers are, especially at your school. So if you're thinking I got ripped off going down there, yeah, fuck you. I. I've taught at the super hip schools, Columbia and uh, Yale, of course. And you know what? The students there are not that much better and not that much worse. So get over this, get to work and, and listen to what Harrison said, form a vampire coven. Otherwise you'll start feeding on rats alone. Can you talk about, um, I'm going to, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I have to hold my glasses the way you do. This is, this is so they stay on your face. There you I've go. Never See? Done that. That, look, no, that looks good. You're doing it right. Thank you. Okay. So uh, there's a question that Erica Mass asks, which is, can you talk more about how you came to work as a writer when you originally wanted to be an artist? What was that like? Where was the moment where you're like, oh, I, I'm a critic. When did you realize that? Well, I never, th uh, thank you, Ale it was Alexandra. Uh, Erica. Erica, I'm sorry, Erica. Erica, thanks for asking. I still don't think of myself as a critic. So I never had that, aha, I'm a critic moment. 
I don't have it after the Pulitzer Prize, I swear to you. Like I said, I'm sort of, you, if you, do you kids remember a name called Sister Wendy? Or anyway, I taught myself to write first the way, I, I, sitting in the trucks, reading Art Form, the big glossy magazine with all those ads in it. And we used to read it when there were ads in art magazines 30 days ago and get jealous and pissed off and envious and all of that stuff. And then I'd read the magazine and I never understood a damn word, not one word. And I thought, oh, I better learn to write that way. So at first I thought I had to write like the commodified object of the late capitalist post-Marxian simulacra finds itself in a dialectic with, you know, interrogating the subject of the differential. What the hell was I talking about? I don't know. Uh, I'm not built to write that way. There's nothing wrong with theory or any of those people. I just can't understand it. It's like some weird Mandarin written by 155 people for a, another 155 people that all review each other's shows and they, they seem to be at every party and I wish, I, anyway, I'm envious still. I, one day, and this was from a deadline, I still remember it, putting off writing some stupid review for $50. There was no time left. And I wrote stuff about an, a painter named Stephen Westfall that I really thought I wrote what I liked and what I didn't like. And when it was over, I'm sure the review, again, might have been terribly written, Alexa, but Erica, I, Erica Roberta remembered your name, yeah. Ugh, Erica, but I knew instantaneously that I had finally found the first inkling of my own voice. And then I started writing, I thought, this is what I want. I write, I want to write the way I talk, the way a phone call goes or a text message. And I want art to be interesting and fun. And I want it to be that for you too, you kids. I want you to follow me on social media at Jerry Saltz. And um, I would say for you kids, Instagram. I want you to post on Instagram, but not just your own damn work. Bull ring, bull ring, bull ring. I want you to, every little weird thing you see, post it. Do some, post things that are more vulnerable, that show me a matrix of how you see the world. Not so many dogs and not so many meals of food, okay? And I'm a cat person. Any more of I talked out your ears, I'm sorry. I have one last question. One question. All right, and this is something that's concrete, and I think it's a more it's more complicated than it sounds. But when you talk about this in the book, what are you? What are your suggestions for writing a coherent artist statement? Really important. Okay, I've never met anybody that can't write. Never. Can you write your name? You can write. If you can fill out a form. You can write. The one way I don't want you to write is the way all artist statements are written, which is a lot like that terrible Mandarin language that I just talked to from art form. Mm -hmm. I want you to write in your own voice, kiss, K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid, okay? You can write, I grew up and I really liked magic. I used to do card tricks. And if that's where your work came from, or your mom once took you to an art museum and you had an existential revelation, or you have a dirty mind, but a clean life. And that's what you wanna write about, or a clean mind, but a dirty life. Anything that you are, I'm asking you to be able to reveal, but you don't have to tell your secrets. 
Those can be your secrets. Nobody really will ever have to know that. But just keep it simple, really simple. And do me one favor. Write an artist statement describing what you do, what your work is. Maybe a little bit what it looks like for God's sake, not just that it's trying to square the dialectic of the post-capitalist bullshit. And give your 75 word lousy artist statement to Nana, who's never seen your work and go, Nana, would you read this and tell me what my work might look like? Mm. That's all I want. And if somebody can tell you this much, that much, what your work looks like, it's a good artist statement. One last secret. I've been on all those hotsy totsy panels. Those statements don't mean much. And if you write them in your own voice, you can, you'll get a grant. One of the best statements I ever read, and I never want you to do this because I've spread it around and they'll know you're lying, is <laughs> I need money. And I thought, that's pretty good. We did not give it to that person, but that's the best start in this art statement. Just keep it simple, stupid. You can write, I promise you. You're, you won't write worse than I write, okay? And read me for God's sake and follow me on the stupid social media where all we, yeah, I have to do this too, please. <laughs> Hello, I love you. <laughs> it's a Riverhead Books. Thank you, Scad. Thank you, Harrison. You're amazing. I love the painting on over your uh, uh, left shoulder. Isn't that great, you guys? That's great art. That was somebody as bad as you that had something they just wanted to say. Gary, thank you so much um, for that wisdom. And students, let me encourage you to get this book. It really, it's, this is, this is a book that you can come back to. It's a book that it's, it reminds me of Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird. It's a book that it's got these little bite-sized uh, chunks of wisdom in it that will mean different things to you throughout your career, I think. And uh, let me encourage you to get it and give it to people you love. Let me also remind you guys to come back here tomorrow at 11. We have Tricky Stewart, who produced Beyonce's Single Ladies, who will be in conversation with Audra. Um, Can I come? Yeah, Jerry, from Jerry Saltz to Single Ladies. I mean, this Forget is... Forget me. Do Single Ladies. Forget me. This is the coolest, weirdest spring at SCAD. Thank you, Jerry, for being a part of it. Thank you guys for, uh, for being a part of this, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Scott. Bye, guys.